Anime Recap here. Today I'm going to explain a harem romantic comedy anime called Invaders of the Rokujoma. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Satomi Kotaro has to start living by himself to go to high school. The problem is that he's broke. Thankfully, his best friend, Matsudaira Kenji, nicknamed Makenji, helped him find a cheap place to stay. His favorite thing about his apartment is that the rent is only 5,000 yen. It also helps that his landlady, Kasagi Shizuka, is the same age as him. While settling, he calls his father, who tells him that he was blindsided by his job relocation. As Kotaro stares at a childhood photo with his mother and father, he tells his old man to look for someone new there. He then spends his first night living alone in a deep sleep. In fact, he's so tired and maybe elated that his room is dirt cheap that he doesn't wake up when an earthquake shakes the entire room up. The next day, Kotaro shows up for work at a dig site, and Mackenzie is also there. The two friends have a chat while doing their jobs. Mackenzie brings up that apparently Kotaro's apartment is haunted. Kotaro dismisses this, saying that no ghost can chase him out of his place even if that's true. While at work, he hears a mysterious voice calling on his name. Curious, he follows it until he steps on soft soil and falls deep into the ground. When he opens his eyes, he sees a woman surrounded by light. She says that she has been waiting for him. He realizes that the voice he heard was hers. He reaches for her hand, but before he can do so, he wakes up in the hospital, with Mackenzie looking after him. It turns out that when Kotaro fell, he hit his head, rendering him unconscious. Was the meeting with the mysterious woman all a dream? That day, while Kotaro is walking with Shizuka and Mackenzie to school, an unknown girl is seen taking pictures of them. After class, Kotaro goes to the knitting club to officially fill out his application form. There, he is greeted by Sakuraba Harumi, the club president. Just as he arrives home, Kotaro meets yet another girl. Meeting girls is all fine and dandy, but certainly not when he's meeting them inside his apartment. Taken aback, Kotaro asks who she is and how she got into his place. When she doesn't answer, he nonchalantly picks her up and carries her out of his apartment. Strangely enough, the girl gets surprised that he can see and touch her. Then, it's Kotaro's turn to get shocked when the girl passes through the locked door. She introduces herself as Higashi Hongan Sanae, the ghost who lives in his apartment. Sanae then starts attacking him by using her powers or throwing random things at him, wanting him to leave. In the face of a haunted apartment, most people would be running for the hills now. But that only means that those people aren't horror movie protagonists. Or, well, broke as hell in Kotaro's case. He absolutely refuses to leave, asserting that finding a cheap apartment is not easy. The two fight over who gets to stay in the apartment, both determined to drive out the other. In the middle of their battle, a girl with her broom interrupts them, crashing into the apartment. She breaks the glass window, causing shards of glass to scatter on the floor. Kotaro, still not yet finished with his business with Sanae, asks the new girl who she is. She introduces herself as magical girl Rainbow Yurika. Kotaro thinks she's a cosplayer, with Sanae agreeing with his assumption, but Yurika insists that she isn't. When asked what she's doing in the apartment, she replies that a huge amount of energy is piling up in the room. She also tells them that dark magical girls will try to use this energy for evil. Neither Kotaro nor Sanae buys this, so Yurika is sent outside the apartment. With the weird stranger gone, the two can finally focus on their battle for who gets to own the place. However, Yurika's cries for help disrupt their plans. The girl keeps on crying, asking them to let her in, which basically dampens their fighting spirit. The mood is totally ruined with the weird girl crying and pleading outside. Eventually, the two call it a truce for now and allow Yurika inside. Now inside, she asks them whether they now believe that she is a magical girl, but they honestly reply that they do not. This leaves the magical girl Rainbow feeling disheartened. Suddenly, the floor of the room opens, and two mysterious creatures appear from underground. They are followed by a girl named Kura no Kiriha. Poor Kotaro, all he wanted was a 5,000 yen apartment and now he's getting hassled by these cute supernatural girls. Whatever shall he do? Kiriha proceeds to describe herself as a descendant of the Earth People and a member of the Kurano Clan, underground people who are masters of oracles and incantations. Kiriha then explains that their clan has recently discovered the location of a shrine, important to their people, and that the shrine happens to be Kotaro's room. 
Kiriha plans to reward Kotaro with gold bars, but he doesn't give in to this. Not when Kiriha and her clan are planning to invade the surface. While dealing with Kiriha, yet another girl appears out of nowhere. This time, it's a princess. Kotaro makes a lovely first impression on her when his face gets accidentally buried in her phone. So the princess here easily develops a hatred for him. She starts attacking him over this mishap and Kiriha quickly shields Kotaro and the other girls. But she falls short, and eventually the room gets destroyed. The new girl is Teamilis, princess of the Holy Fortorth Galactic Empire. But just as she's about to use an antimatter cannon that can kill everyone in the room, her underling Ruth stops her. She convinces her to ease up as destroying the planet will violate the Intergalactic War Treaty. This intervention reveals that Princess Teamilis' task is to make the humans swear loyalty to her. Obviously, this will not happen if the princess wipes out said humans. The chaos continues when Shizuka, the landlady, enters the apartment. She sees the sorry state of Kotaro's room and all the other girls who are with him. Fueled by anger, Shizuka gets violent, striking the fear of God in Kotaro and his supernatural motley crew. She warns them that the next time they destroy any part of the building or disturb neighbors, she will make them regret that they are alive. With no other choice, Kotaro tries to explain the situation to his landlady. He has a ghost, aliens, an underground person, and a cosplayer fighting to have his room. In response, Shizuka makes them all sign a contract called the Kuroda Convention. This treaty is meant to contain the chaos and minimize the damages in Shizuka's poor apartment. This forbids anyone from using atomic, biological, or chemical weapons, perform large AoE attacks, and among other disruptive attacks. Furthermore, combat between 6 to 7 p.m. and on weekends and national holidays aren't allowed. Sounds pretty reasonable. Ruth explains that Princess Tiamalis is undergoing a trial for the right to get the Fortorthan throne. A computer randomly generates the coordinates of the territory she needs to lay claim to for the Empire. To complete the trial, she must compel the territory's intelligent inhabitants to swear loyalty to her. With that explanation out of the way, Tayamalus arrogantly demands Kotaro to yield his loyalty and apartment to her, but the boy refuses to budge. No way is he giving up his 5,000 yen room. The other ladies aren't willing to give up either. Sanae claims that she's been there the longest and Kiri has bent on rebuilding her shrine there. The egoist Tayamalus makes fun of them for being self-serving while Yurika, the only non-selfish person there, weakly tells them that she has to drive out the bad guys who are after the energy in the apartment. Just like before, her spiel is dismissed by Kotaro and Sanae, who just think that it's her cosplay spiel. Soon enough, the five of them settle for having one-sixth of the room. Each sixth will be worth 180 points, and each centimeter will be worth one point. They have to compete for the points through a card game. The winners get points from the losers and will be able to expand their territories. The one who comes in first will take three points from the last in place. Whoever comes in second will take one point from the fourth placer, and the third placer neither gains nor loses any points. Kiriha explains that they will be holding five games a day, and each person will get the chance to choose which game to play. For their first day, Kiriha gets first place. The next day, Kotaro asks Sanae to keep an eye on the apartment for him, since he will be at school. At the knitting club, Kotaro tries his best to learn how to knit. Harumi, the club president, guides him and gives him tips on doing it correctly. It is also revealed that the girl observing them from a distance before was just Yurika. Back at Tiamalis' home, she observes Kotaro using their advanced alien technology. She ponders on how she will make him swear his loyalty to her. Ruth recommends her to spend time with him to accomplish this, giving the princess an idea. One day after school, Makenji finds Kotaro sitting alone in the classroom. He asks him why he is there, and Kotaro replies that he doesn't have club activities that day and wants to relax. Makenji wonders why he doesn't just go home already. But Kotaro does not elaborate. Kiriha overhears this conversation through her underlings and decides to cook a meal to help him relax. That night, delicious dishes are served at Kotaro's apartment. Sanae, Teya, Ruth, and Yurika are there as well. Seeing the flavorful dishes that Kiri has cooked, Sanaya begs Kotaro to let her possess him since she can't eat while she's a ghost. Kotaro agrees. Luckily for him, the possession process is fairly simple. 
All Sanai has to do is to cling to his bag. And they're all set to eat. Everyone has a splendid meal thanks to Kitty has cooking. The following day, they all decide to play a card game. While Kotaro goes for a bathroom break, Taya tells Kiriha that she knows that she's been doing more than just cooking meals these past nights. In turn, Kiriha retorts that she also noticed that Taya's been devising some plans of her own. The next day at school, Kotaro is shook to the core when four new students are introduced to his class. You already know where this is going. Those new students turn out to be Kiriha, Taya, Ruth, and Yurika. Happy days! During lunch, Taya and Ruth encounter the most ruthless guys in school, the boys' cheer squad. Two classmates come to their rescue, saying that whoever crosses them always ends up regretting it. Meanwhile, Yurika meets Harumi in the hallways, asking her for the direction of the student club's building. Being the kind person that she is, Harumi guides her. While looking for Kotaro, Yurika gets surrounded by a group of girls who all turn out to be members of the cosplay society. These girls then take her away. Kotaro watches these events unfold from a safe distance. Relieved, he thinks that Yurika will now be gone for good. Gone from his apartment at least. When they got home, they play card games once again. In the middle of one, Taya finally loses it and declares that she's tired of playing card games all the time. Kotaro agrees with her, saying that he's tired of it himself. In response to this, Kiriha proposes that they participate in the school's inter-club obstacle course marathon. Taya and Kotaro approve of this right away. According to the rules of the inter-club marathon, each participating pair must be from the same club. Now Kotaro has to convince the only other member of his club, Harumi, to join the event with him. Harumi is initially reluctant since she has a weak body and is not the athletic type, but Kotaro manages to persuade her. Anything for that sweet 5,000 yen apartment. As for Sanae, how will she be able to participate in the game? Naturally, as a ghost, she won't be able to, so they laid down a rule that she gets to choose a participant, and they can share the same rank. Sanae chooses Kotaro. Kiriha is chosen to participate in the marathon as one of the representatives of her club. On the other hand, Taya is able to take over the boys' cheer squad. Taya's technology detects Kiriha's dolls in the air, and she plans to intercept them. But according to the Corona Convention, she cannot be hostile towards Kiriha. Despite this, she decides to proceed with the attack anyway. Kiriha's dolls and Taya's robot engage in a fight midair. At the school, Sanae, Taya, and Kiriha observe the spectacle as Kotaro trains with his partner, Harumi. Sanae explains that Harumi is like Kotaro's princess, and he is the knight. Following this logic, Taya becomes pissed at Kotaro for pledging his loyalty to someone else. The day of the inter-club marathon finally arrives. Kiriha and her partner are off to a good start as they rank first in the competition, knocking the other opponents down. Taya and her partner come second, without Taya really doing anything while her partner carries her shouting, Hail to the princess! Kotaro and Harumi are lagging behind, but they are not discouraged by this. Kotaro carries Harumi and follows the others. Due to their clumsiness, Yurika comes in last. She hasn't even started running yet. The marathon's problem-solving portion stumps Kotaro. On the other hand, Harumi answers it correctly and goes ahead of him. Kotaro refuses to let Sanae help him, and after solving it, he catches up to Teya, who has lost the second spot and is now running herself. Throughout the marathon, the participants need to overcome different types of obstacles. Their ranks have been consistently changing except for one person, the undisputed number one, Kiriha. During the marathon, Harumi meets a very tired Yurika, whom she helps to get up from the ground. Yurika remembers Harumi as the nice girl who helped her find her way to the student club's building. Exhausted, Yurika thinks about giving up, but Harumi encourages her to go on. The eighth obstacle course is to balance on planks, but Taya has planted shock bombs around the ground so that anyone who touches the planks is hit. This makes the obstacle even harder than it already is. Because of the bombs Taya's placed, everyone is now stuck on the planks course. Many have been blown away and only a few are left to finish the marathon. As for Yurika and Harumi, the girls are still stuck in last place. While the pair continues to run, Harumi suddenly falls and passes out. There are no medics in sight and the only one who can help Harumi is Yurika. There is only one thing she can do, and that's transforming into a cosplayer, I mean, a magical girl. 
she uses a special move called Remove Disease on Harumi to get her back on track. Back to the front lines, Kotaro is all set to become the winner. That is, until he falls to the ground and passes out from exhaustion. The second and third place, Kiriha and Teya, battle it out one last time. And for the last obstacle course, they have to duke it out through a bring me game. Tatalicious Kiriha has to bring an A cup bra or smaller, while Flat Justice Teya must bring in a D cup or larger. Is it even legal to ask high schoolers to. Moving on. Fortunately or unfortunately for them, they don't have to look any further since what they're looking for is just each other. While Taya and Kiri have battled it out, the finish line has already been crossed. And as for the winner of the marathon, it's a tie. A tie between Yurika's cosplay club and Kotaro and Harumi's knitting club. Now who said nice guys finish last? Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.